All right, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to week number two of PPA 500. Hope everyone is doing well. Hope you're doing better than I am. I, if you can't tell, I'm under the weather tonight, so I don't know if we're going to do a full class. We'll probably do a, a partial class tonight, but we'll see how long we can go and how much information we can get through this evening. But I didn't want to cancel class because we only have a certain number of meetings, and I I really would have to, I would hate to have to miss uh, one of our meetings. So we'll probably just do a, a partial class this evening. But uh, let me start by thanking you for your introductory, introductory. posts. Um, I've gone through and read those posts. And uh, if you haven't done your introductory posts yet, please do make sure to do that. It is not graded, but it does uh, allow you to introduce yourself to me as well as to your classmates. So we can all get to know each other a little bit better as we proceed through the next, I guess, seven weeks uh, together as a class. So please do the introductory post if you haven't done that yet. Uh, you don't have anything due for next week, but in two weeks, you have your initial skill self-assessment that is due, as well as Canvas essay number one. And uh, one or two people have already turned in the initial skill self-assessment, which would look very good. Again, with this initial skill self-assessment, there are no right or wrong answers. It's a credit, no credit assignment. As long as you complete the three sections, you will get credit for, for that assignment. And then for Canvas essay number one, uh, remember for that one, you are gonna provide three posts, one answer to my initial prompt, and then a response to two of your classmates. Your response to my initial prompt, about two paragraphs will probably be good enough to get the job done. And then certainly one paragraph for each of the responses to a classmate will certainly be sufficient. For Canvas essay number one, you're going to be looking at Federalist paper number 10, uh, which was written by James Madison. And in it, James Madison talks about the negative impacts that factions can have in a democracy and essentially talks about his idea of a compound republic that contrary to the prevailing political wisdom at the time, Madison believed that the most effective type of government would be what he called a compound government, where you have heterogeneity of ideas, you have heterogeneity of groups, and then you can balance groups against each other. The prevailing political philosophy at the time was more along the lines of Montesquieu's compact republic, where a lot of political philosophers thought that the only way to effectively have a government is to have homogeneity of opinion, have a small jurisdiction, people sharing pretty much the same opinions, and that's the way in which you would govern a society. Madison made the completely opposite argument, which was, no pun intended, revolutionary at the time, where no, the most effective form of government, I won't say best, but the most effective form of government is one where you have heterogeneity of opinion, and you do have kind of like this marketplace of ideas where people can share ideas, bounce ideas off each other, and then balance the uh, one faction against another faction, you know, one interest group against another interest group. And so for this Canvas essay number one, after you read Federalist paper number 10, you'll be answering the question of if you feel that our society is more factionalized today than it was when Madison wrote Federalist paper number 10, and if you do believe it's more factionalized today, which most people do, uh, what, what can we do about it? What is there to be done to try and control some of the effects of these factions? Madison in Federalist Number 10 essentially makes the argument that there are two ways you can deal with factions, you know, these groups, they have differing opinions. One way is to eliminate them, but he says by eliminating factions, by eliminating these different opinions and ideas, you're essentially destroying democracy. So the second approach is the one that he favored, and that's controlling their effects. And you can control the effects of factions by balancing one faction against another faction. And that was kind of the whole idea behind that compound republic that he's advocating for in Federalist Paper Number 10. So that's the subject for your first Canvas essay, which is due, I believe, on September 11th, then along with that initial skill self-assessment. Okay, um, those are your upcoming assignments, uh, but again, they're not due for a couple of weeks. Does anyone have any questions or require any clarifications for any of the information we covered last week in terms of the introduction to the course, um, introduction to the MPA program? Everyone good? Okay. Okay. 
All right, then what we are going to do tonight is we're going to begin our discussion of substantive information with a discussion of the basic foundational elements of American government and what those foundational elements then mean for the study of public administration. And again, we spend time doing this because you know, some people have come into this class straight out of a political science undergrad degree, but the vast majority of people do not. And so some folks you know, have had an undergraduate American government course maybe 20 or 30 years ago, uh, depending on what, where you went to school. Some people may have not had an undergraduate American government course and may have not covered this information since a civics course in high school. So to kind of create that even playing field, I think it's important we spend this night talking about these basic foundational principles of American government. Now, as Americans, we know that our system of government is really predicated upon the idea of limitation of power, specifically the limitation of governmental power. So we limit governmental power because in our system of democracy, we really do believe that power emanates from the people, that power comes from individual citizens, and individual citizens will then enter into an agreement with their government to give up some of these powers, to give up some of these rights and these liberties, and then government will use those rights and liberties judiciously in order to provide for the welfare of society. So it's very much an agreement between people and their government. And what we'll talk about in a second is social contract theory. So since the, the power comes from the people, we need to then have mechanisms to try and limit the exercise of power by government. And so our governmental system is predicated upon limitation of powers, which then provides us with these two basic pillars of our system, a horizontal limitation of power in separation of powers, and then a vertical limitation of power through our system of federalism. So as you all know, separation of powers means that we have different branches of government. We have an executive, we have a legislative, we have an executive, and we have a judicial branch. Those three branches of government are all spoken of in Articles 1, 2, and 3 of the Constitution. And as we go through the Constitution at a later time, we will see that the framers really spent most of their time and most of their energy in detail talking about the legislature. They spend most of their time talking about Congress, its organization, um, who will be able to populate Congress, the requirements of serving in Congress, the powers or duties of Congress. Article one is by far the longest and most detailed part of the Constitution. Article two then deals with the executive branch. It deals with the presidency. That is much shorter than Article one and contains much many fewer details than what we saw in Article one of the Constitution. And then the judiciary is spoken of in Article 3, and specifically Article 3 only talks about one court, and that is the Supreme Court. There aren't a whole lot of details given in Article 3. There are no qualifications listed for serving on the Supreme Court, and all other courts that are below the Supreme Court were all then given to Congress to decide. So Congress had the ability to make all courts below the Supreme Court. So not a whole lot of details that the framers gave us in terms of this judicial branch. But the idea here is by having three different branches of government separating power horizontally, we can then end up balancing power against power. So it's a mechanism for the limitation of power. Federalism is then our vertical limitation of power where we divide up power and duties and functions among different levels of government, the national government versus state governments. Now, under the original Constitution, local governments were not included. Local governments did not have any protection or any standing under the original Constitution. There is a judicial principle that's known as Dillon's Rule, and it's named after a judge, and Judge Dillon. And Dillon's Rule essentially says that local governments are creatures of the state that states can create local governments, states can then empower local governments, and if states decide appropriate, states can then eliminate you know, those local governments. Local governments belong to the states, and so that's why local governments are not mentioned in the Constitution. So when we're talking about federalism as a vertical division of power, we're really talking about constitutional federalism, the balance of power between the national government and state government. 
So we divide up powers uh, horizontally with separation of powers, and then we divide up power vertically through our system of federalism. Now, when most people talk about the type of government we have here in the U.S., they typically talk about us being a democracy. And it is true that there are some democratic principles and some vestiges of democracy in our system of government. But more accurately, what we really are is we're more of a constitutional republic, more of a democratic republic, in that we combine the elements of a democracy with the elements of a Republican form of government. So my first question for you here tonight is, whenever you hear the word democracy, what do you think of when you think of democracy? What makes a government a democracy? As always, you can either participate through text chat, or if you'd like to open up your microphone and participate in that way, that is, is fine as well. So what's a democracy? What makes a government a democracy? Representation makes it a democracy. Yeah, in our system of democracy, we have a system of, of representation. Um, we have people who are, are participating in their own governance. We have people who are voting on laws that affect them, as Crystal says, uh, where those representatives are chosen by the people. So in a democracy, when you think about democracy, we think about power residing with the people and people taking an active role and participating in their own self-determination and their own self-governance. Direct democracy really speaks to this idea of voting directly and making decisions directly on issues that affect the public. So if you think about here in the state of California, we have arguably more vestiges of a direct democracy system than a lot of other states in the country. Here in California, we have things such as the initiative process, and we also have referenda. The initiative process and referenda are ways in which people can make decisions directly themselves rather than relying upon their elected representatives to make those decisions. With an initiative process like we have here in California, a group of citizens can get together, and if they can get enough signatures on a petition, they will then submit those signatures to the Secretary of State. If those signatures are then validated, then they can force an issue onto the ballot so the people will vote directly upon that issue. Oftentimes, constitutional amendments here in the state of California are voted on directly by the people and oftentimes come from this initiative type of a process. So with the initiative, people are the impetus behind getting these issues on the ballot for people to vote directly on. Then another example is what's called a referendum. And with the referendum, the state legislature decides that this issue is something we want the people to vote on. So rather than us making the decision here in Sacramento, we will then place a referendum on the ballot and then allow people to vote directly on that issue on the ballot come election day. So the difference between an initiative and a referendum, the initiative comes directly from the people, and the people put it on the ballot. The referendum comes from the state legislature, where the state legislature puts it on an upcoming ballot. But both the initiative and the referendum process really represent direct democracy, where people are directly voting and directly making decisions on policies and issues that are important to them. We have both initiative as well as referendum process here in the state of California. Not every state has an initiative process. Even states that do have an initiative process, sometimes they have a very high bar that citizens have to meet in order to force an issue onto the ballot. They may require an inordinate amount of signatures that are just really impossible to get before an issue can make it, <clears throat> excuse me, onto the ballot. Uh, some states, when they do have an initiative or a referendum process, will have super majority requirements for the uh, public to pass that initiative. Uh, we saw that in the state of Ohio recently, where the state legislature put a referendum on the ballot to try and increase the percentage of voters that need to support something for it to become part of the Constitution in order to make a constitutional amendment. 
they want to increase it from a simple majority up to a super majority of, of 60 percent. Uh, that went down to defeat. And that went down to defeat in uh, in the lead up to what will eventually then be an initiative that will be placed on the ballot in Ohio for uh, incorporating abortion rights into the Constitution. So different states have different approaches they use with initiatives and referenda. But initiatives and referenda are direct democracy measures that some states have and some states do not. But what we all share as a nation is this idea of being a Republican form of government, which means we are a republic. And as a republic, we then vote for people to represent us. We vote for people to go and make decisions for us. So we select people to go to Long Beach and serve on city council. We select people to go to Sacramento and serve in the assembly and the, and the state senate. We select people to go to Washington, D.C. and serve in the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. So when we select representatives, we are, in essence, a Republican type of government. And again, this is democracy with a small d and Republican with a small r. This does not reflect political parties. So I think one of the most accurate ways to describe our system of government is that we are a democratic republic. We are a republic in that we elect representatives. But we do have some elements that we can use in order to participate directly in the decision-making process as individual citizens. Now, there are a lot of countries around the country that around the world that will call themselves a democracy, but they're really not what we would consider a democracy. And there are countries around the world that will call themselves a republic, which really are not a republic. To be a democratic republic, you have to have these vestiges of direct democracy and then you also have to have free and open elections where people can select who they want to represent them in the state capital or in the national capital. So we are a democratic republic. So in our democratic republic, as we said, the idea of the framers is that power resides with the people. And people will then give up certain powers and liberties to government. And in exchange, government will then utilize those powers and those liberties in order to provide for the best interests and the welfare of society. This is what you learned in American government as social contract theory. And our entire system of government is predicated upon the idea of social contract theory. Social contract theory that comes directly from philosophers such as John Locke in his second treatise on government where he talked about this idea that people enter into an agreement with their government on how to use those powers that are given to the government to provide for the welfare of the public. Our constitution is our social contract. And so the constitution lays out the parameters of this relationship between the people and their governing officials and their governing institutions. So that's a very important concept, especially for us here in public administration. What it means is that how we interact with the people we are serving will be dictated by these constitutional protections that the people we are serving have built into that constitution. So it's important for us as public administrators to know the constitution, to understand what those rights and liberties are, and then endeavor not to violate those rights and those liberties. As public administrators in a social contract theory, we have what's referred to as qualified good faith immunity, meaning that if we are operating in good faith and we are operating within the parameters of our official duties, then we have immunity from prosecution. Uh, if you're watching what's going on with in Fulton County, Georgia, and with the uh, former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, who just had a court hearing yesterday trying to move his case from the state level to the federal level. One of the arguments that he is making and will continue to make in the future is that what he was doing that he's being charged with in, in Fulton County, Georgia, is that he was doing under the course of his official duties, the course of his position as a federal official. So therefore, the argument he makes is, since I'm doing these things, I did these things in the course of my duties as federal employee, as chief of staff, I should therefore be immune from prosecution under qualified good faith immunity. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. The judge has not made a ruling yet on, on that motion. But that's kind of an example, this idea of operating within the confines and the parameters of your position as a public administrator. 
So since the relationship between people and their governmental entities is really going to be determined by this social contract, it's important for us in this class to really look closely at the social contracts that we have had in this country since its founding. We have essentially had two social contracts. We have had two constitutions in our history. The first constitution you're probably aware of was called the Articles of Confederation. That was written in 1781 and it lasted until 1787 when it was replaced with the constitution that we currently have today, or at least you know, the basis of the constitution we currently have today. I included on our Canvas site links to both the Articles Confederation as well as the Constitution. So hopefully you had a chance to take a look at the Articles Confederation. As you look through the articles, there are a couple of things that probably will, will strike you. One thing that is interesting in the Articles Confederation is that very early on in the articles, the framers of the articles described the Articles Confederation as a firm league of friendship that it represented a firm league of friendship between the states. It truly was a confederation. And a confederation is different than a federation in that in a confederation, at least at the time of the framers, each state remained sovereign. That's what makes it a confederation. Each state retained its own sovereignty. And so in this firm league of friendship, it was a league of friendship between sovereign entities. Another thing that's interesting when you read through the Articles Confederation is the use of the term United States of America. You'll see United States of America capitalized and used as a proper noun one time in the Articles. And when it's capitalized as United States of America as a proper noun, it's where the Articles say the style of this Confederation will or shall be the United States of America. By style, they mean the name. So they're basically saying the name of this confederation will be called the United States of America. Subsequent references to the United States throughout the remainder of the Articles Confederation, those references usually say the United States in Congress assembled. That's a very important point because what the framers of the Articles are saying is that we are the United States when the states get together into this Congress. So when the states are meeting, that's when this is considered the United States. The word Congress as used in the Articles of Confederation can be looked at a little bit differently than we look at it today. Today, when we use the term Congress, we capitalize it and we think about a permanent entity. We think about you know, Capitol Hill and we think about the House of Representatives and the Senate. Congress can also be used as the term for a meeting. So a Congress is a meeting. So tonight we are having a Congress of PPA 500. So think about the implications of that. The states are united and are an entity when they are meeting together, when they are having this Congress, this meeting of the states. So it's a very temporary type of situation. Also under the articles, states could recall their delegates from this quote unquote Congress at any time that they wanted. So if they didn't like what was going on, if, if Virginia didn't like what New York was doing in this Congress, this meeting of the states, they could essentially pick up their marbles and go home. They say, we're gonna recall our delegates and we're gonna pull out of this meeting because they retain their own state sovereignty. Some other features of the Articles Confederation, the uh, articles really provided for essentially a unibranch type of government where it created this meeting of the states but there was not a House of Representatives, there was not a Senate, there was just a Congress of the states that would meet. Uh, there really wasn't an independent president. The president would come from this meeting of the states, and so you didn't have an independent executive, and you essentially did not have any type of independent judiciary either. Now, under the articles, it was difficult to coin money and to come up with uniform currency. And so we had different states that were using different forms of currency. And you can understand what that would then mean for interstate commerce and trade between the states. And there are a lot of other issues with the articles. In order to amend the articles, you had to have a unanimous vote of all 13 states in order to make any amendments to the articles. 
So even though there are flaws in the articles, if you wanted to repair those flaws, you had to get every single state to agree to whatever repair you wanted to put into uh, that Articles of Confederation. So even though it was flawed, it was difficult to take care of those flaws. But by far, one of the biggest issues of the Articles of Confederation was the lack of national defense, the lack of any type of a national standing army or standing navy. And this really came to a head with a galvanizing type of situation that occurred in Shays' Rebellion. And if you are a history major, I'm sure you've probably talked about Shays' Rebellion before and you know all about Shays' Rebellion. But Shays' Rebellion was this rebellion of farmers that was led by a retired army captain by the name of Daniel Shays. So Daniel Shays led these farmers who were irate because they were losing their land, they were having their lands taken away from them, they couldn't make a living, and so they had an uprising and they rebelled. Shays led this rebellion, and it took uh, a long time, it took a number of days before the state militia was able to put down this rebellion. This is what we refer to in public policy as being a triggering event. Whenever you take your 670 policy analysis class, you will talk about the policy process, you will talk about policy formulation. And what oftentimes happens is you need to have some type of a triggering event that really galvanizes public opinion around the idea that we need to make a change to the way in which we are dealing with this policy. And absent that galvanizing event, that triggering event, policies oftentimes don't change. So you think about if you have airline safety legislation that gets passed by Congress. Oftentimes, unfortunately, that airline safety legislation is passed because of a triggering event such as an airline disaster. And you have an airline crash that uh, garners a lot of media attention, and then that really galvanizes opinion around, we really need to change this approach to the way in which we are dealing with airline safety. On a larger, more tragic level, you can think of um, September 11th was a triggering event. As a result of September 11th, we completely transformed our approach to homeland security. We end up getting all these regulations at airports. We end up getting the TSA. We uh, end up getting all these limitations on air travel that we never had before September 11th, because that was a triggering event that galvanized public opinion. Well, Shays' Rebellion was one of those types of triggering events. So people became very concerned that if it was so difficult for us to put down this rebellion, for a state militia to put down this rebellion of farmers, what would we do if we were invaded by a foreign nation? Uh, we would essentially be helpless uh, trying to defend ourselves from foreign invasion. So because of that, the ball really started rolling toward the creation of this constitutional convention. The primary goal of the Constitutional Convention was to merely amend the Articles of Confederation, to amend the Articles in order to strengthen national defense and to provide us with some protection against both domestic insurrection as well as foreign invasion. So the very limited purpose of the Convention was just to amend the Articles. What end up, And the reason why we had to have that Convention is, remember, you need a uh, unanimous vote of all the states to amend the articles. So one of the best ways to get that unanimous vote is to get all the states together into a room, and then you can get unanimous vote on those amendments to the articles. But what happened at the Constitutional Convention is that you essentially had three different conflicts that were being dealt with at the Constitutional Convention. One conflict we had that was being dealt with was the conflict between what we call the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. That text track. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists were led by people like James Madison, who at that time was very much an advocate of a stronger national government. The Anti-Federalists were led by people like Sherman from New Jersey, who really believed in state sovereignty, and they really feared providing too much power to a national government. They felt by creating a powerful national government, we would erode the power and the sovereignty of respective state governments. So you had those two factions. In terms of logistics, it was difficult to get to the Constitutional Convention. It was difficult to get there because the roads were sometimes impassable. You have heavy rains and they were uh, dirt roads, which meant that they would become muddy. You wouldn't be able to travel across those roads. So some delegates got to the Constitutional Convention before other delegates. 
And it just happened that the majority of delegates that got to the convention first were our Federalists, led by James Madison. So they were able, because they were the first ones there, to really get the ball rolling toward replacing the Articles with a brand new Constitution. By the time the Anti-Federalists rolled into town and got to the convention, it was almost too late because the Federalists had already started the ball rolling to uh, replacing the Articles with a new Constitution. Also, another reason why the Federalists were successful at getting a new constitution at the convention was due to a lot of the, um, the debate that was led by, by James Madison. Madison realized that a lot of the anti-Federalists would come to the convention arguing to just amend the articles to make a stronger national defense. Madison knew that he had to get the Anti-Federalists to agree and admit that they wanted more out of a constitution than just national defense. And if you think about the people who served as delegates at the Constitutional Convention, in order to be a delegate at the Constitutional Convention, you had to be white, you had to be male, and you had to be a property owner. White male property owners at that time were what we considered the creditors. Those were the people who had the resources to loan the money to make the revolutionary cause possible. Since they had loaned out money in order to make the revolutionary war possible, they obviously wanted to get those debts repaid. And that was the nerve that Madison was able to press on the Anti-Federalists to get them to agree they wanted more than just national defense. Uh, there's a, a very famous book by a historian uh, by the name of Charles Black. And Charles Black wrote this book, An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution. And in that book, he made that very argument that the delegates who were at the Constitutional Convention were there primarily to represent their own economic self-interest. Now, when Black made that argument, it obviously created a firestorm of criticism. And a lot of other historians said, no, that's not true. They were there for more altruistic reasons. And where the discipline of history has kind of finally come down on the issue is that, yes, there was an economic motivation among the delegates, but it was more of a motivation for the economic interests of their states as opposed to the economic interests of them as individual delegates. But either way, there was an economic imperative that was built into the motives of the delegates at the Constitutional Convention. So as soon as Madison was able to get the Anti-Federalists to agree that they wanted more than just national defense, that they wanted a stronger national government that could wield some power over the economy that would help them get those debts repaid, it was essentially game over for the Articles Confederation. Because at that point, the changes that would be necessary were far larger than just merely amending the articles. It became clear to everyone that they needed a new document, a new social contract, a new constitution. At the Constitutional Convention, we also had a second conflict, and that conflict was between large states and small states. We had delegates there from some of our large states like Virginia and New York and Pennsylvania. And then we had some delegates there from smaller states, such as New Jersey and Delaware and Rhode Island. And the conflict here between large and small states, as you know from American government, was in terms of representation. Large states wanted proportional representation in Congress. Small states wanted equal representation. Large state plan was called the Virginia plan, called for proportional representation. The small state plan was called the New Jersey plan, uh, which called for equal representation from each state. We ended up getting the Great Compromise, otherwise known as the Connecticut Compromise. And the Connecticut Compromise then called for a bicameral legislature, a bicameral legislature that would include a House of Representatives where representation was proportional and a U.S. Senate where representation was equal to senators from each state irrespective of the population of those states. That great compromise allowed large state and small state representatives to, to have something to agree upon and provide them with a middle ground for, for agreement. A third conflict that we had was the conflict between slave states and non-slave states. 
And I think you can make an argument that in terms of the conflict between Federalists and Anti-Federalists, they found multiple compromises that worked out well in the Constitution. In terms of the large state, small state disagreement, again, they had compromises that they were able to work out in terms of a bicameral legislature. However, in terms of the slave state, non-slave state conflict, the compromises that the framers came to were obviously much worse than what we saw in the other two areas. The way in which the framers decided to deal with this conflict between slave and non-slave states. Slave states obviously wanted to continue the slave trade. They wanted to continue the institution of slavery. And many of those delegates wanted to incorporate language into the Constitution that would validate slavery. They wanted to build slavery as an institution into the Constitution. Non-slave states obviously did not want to have slavery in the Constitution. They wanted to see an end to the slave trade, and they wanted to see an end to the expansion of slavery into the new territories. So you had a, a, a big difference in motivations between slave states and non-slave states. So the two compromises, prominent compromises, that the framers put into the Constitution to deal with this was the Three-Fifths Compromise. And in the Three-Fifths Compromise in Article One, Section 2 of the Constitution, they wrote that enslaved people would count as three-fifths of a free person for the purposes of representation in the House of Representatives. Then another compromise, if you will, it's hard to call it a compromise, but another compromise that they put in was in Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, where they banned any laws that would eliminate the slave trade until the year 1808. So they basically punted the issue of the slave trade to a future generation said, we're not going to allow any rules that will outlaw the slave trade until at least 1808. Those two compromises, the three-fifths compromise and the uh, prohibition against banning the slave trade, obviously those are two compromises that have haunted the nation ever since. And those are two compromises that led directly to the Civil War. Uh, obviously, a three-fifths compromise is no longer in the Constitution but it did certainly lead to perpetuating slavery throughout and up to the Civil War. So I think you make an argument in terms of the first two conflicts, the compromises were workable compromises that really created the structure of our government. Obviously, with the compromise between slave and non-slave states, those were destructive compromises on many fronts. So these conflicts had to be worked through in the Constitutional Convention, and what it did is it created a constitution, a social contract, that is really a series of compromises. Whenever you have a document that is a series of compromises, you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have disagreements on interpretation, and we've been dealing with those disagreements on interpretation ever since the Constitution was originally ratified. Now, again, going back to this Federalist, Anti-Federalist type of conflict, the Anti-Federalists were still not mollified after the Constitution was adopted at the Convention. They still felt that this Constitution provided too much power to national governments and took away power from state sovereignty. So when it came time to ratify the Constitution, you still had Anti-Federalists who, uh, who were kind of dragging their feet, who did not want to ratify the Constitution. In order to ratify the Constitution, you had to get nine states' approval before the Constitution could go into effect. And within about a year, they were successful at getting nine states to ratify the Constitution. However, one state that did not ratify the Constitution was the state of New York, and that was very problematic. The state of New York was the linchpin of commerce in the colonies. And everything, all commerce going through the colonies was essentially, most of it would flow through the port of New York. And so if you didn't have New York on board with this new constitution, this new national government, you really had nothing. And so the framers knew they had to convince the citizens of New York and the leaders in New York to ratify this new constitution. So the two strategies that were used that you're familiar with, I'm sure, in order to get this constitution ratified by New York we initially amended the Constitution with the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, uh, 
explicitly providing for things such as freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, um, freedom to petition uh, for redress of grievances. Uh, we provided you know, uh, protections in terms of um, uh, the Second Amendment protections, in terms of the right to bear arms, provided protections in terms of your home where you don't have to quarter soldiers and the Third Amendment, uh, some criminal justice protections, such as protections against unwarrantable search and seizure, protections against double jeopardy, protections against self-incrimination, uh, provisions for uh, indictment by grand juries, uh, the protection that you cannot have life, liberty, or property removed without due process of law, um, the protections in terms of no excess fines, no excess bail, no uh, cruel and unusual punishment, protections against um, uh, protection for having a jury trial in civil cases where the amount is more than $20, which sounds trivial today, but was important then. Uh, limitations on what the national government can do vis-a-vis -vis state governments and individuals, saying that any powers that are not given to the national government are then reserved for the people and or to the states. So these this tenth amendment, these uh, ten amendments, this Bill of Rights provides a lot of those protections that anti-federalists were looking for to truly limit the overarching power of the national government. So the Bill of Rights helped to mollify a lot of those anti-federalists. Then the second thing that was done was the writing of the Federalist Papers. And again, I assigned you three Federalist Papers saying really focus on two of them, Federalist number 10 and Federalist number 39. There are 85 Federalist Papers, 85 Federalist Papers written by Alexander Hamilton, James Masson, and John Jay. 51 of those papers were written by Alexander Hamilton. 29 were written by James Madison, and only five of those were written by John Jay. John Jay fell ill after writing five and, and didn't complete any others. And so Hamilton basically picked up the slack and, and finished the remaining papers. In those Federalist Papers, Hamilton, Madison, and to a lesser extent, Jay argued for why this new national government would not be too powerful. They essentially argued why anti-federalists should not be afraid of this new national government. And so two of the Federalist Papers that you are reading for this class, Federalist 10 and Federalist 39. In Federalist number 10, which we've already talked about at the outset of class tonight, is where Madison talks about controlling the effects of factions. So people were concerned that if you had this compound republic, and you had all this heterogeneity of opinion and all these different groups that disagreed with each other, that the nation would tear itself apart. And so in Federalist 10, Madison basically gives us the roadmap for how we can avoid that type of situation from happening. And that's the one that you'll be talking about then in Canvas essay number one. Probably my favorite Federalist paper, you know, I know it sounds kind of wonky to say that, but my Federalist favorite, uh, fed, favorite Federalist paper is Federalist paper number 39. In Federalist Paper number 39, James Madison, I think, makes a very cogent argument for why anti-federalists and why the states should not fear this new constitution. And when you read Federalist 39, you'll see that he makes two arguments. The first argument he makes is do not fear this new constitution, do not fear this new national government, because it's very similar to what you currently have in your own states. The Constitution is not unlike what you have in your state constitutions. The Office of Presidency is not unlike what you currently have in your governor's offices. You've got a president who is going to um, be limited in terms of uh, balance with the uh, legislature and balance with the judiciary, much like what we see in the state constitutions. You, your president is going to have a four-year term, which is actually shorter than the terms of a lot of governors in a lot of your states. So you shouldn't be afraid of that. So you shouldn't be afraid of Congress in that the National Congress looks and operates very similar to the way in which state legislatures work and operate as well. So in, in, in essence, he's saying, don't be afraid because you've seen all this before. And this is very similar to what you currently have in your states. It's nothing earth shattering, it's nothing to be afraid of. But then the second argument he makes, which I think is even the more compelling argument, is he says, let's deconstruct the Constitution. Let's break it down into its component elements. For the purpose of asking the question, is this new Constitution 
is it um, national or is it federal in nature? Meaning, is it centralized with power for the national government or is it decentralized with power for state governments? So let's see if it's national or federal in nature. And so he does that for each element of the Constitution. He says, let's see how the Constitution was formed. So this Constitution was not formed by individuals. It was formed by delegates who were there representing their states. So the states created the Constitution. So therefore, it was very federal in terms of its creation. It was very state-centric in terms of its creation. Now, that was a very compelling argument that Madison made at the time in Federalist 39. I think what Madison didn't realize is by making that argument, he had then laid the seeds for the Civil War, because it was that argument that the states created the Union that Southern states then used in the 1860s to then secede from the Union, to then say, well, we created the Union, so therefore we can pull out of the Union. So Mass, I don't think, wanted to create that perception, but I think that was perception that he did create with that argument. Then he said, let's look at the operation of government. Who will be in charge of operating the national government? Here, he kind of throws his hands up and says, okay, it's national. It's going to be operated by individual people, so therefore it does have a national component. But let's look at the powers of the national government. Where do those powers come from? Those powers come from the states in that the people who will be elected to serve in Congress will probably be coming out of state legislatures. So they are going to be more beholden to the state than they are to the national government. And that was true at that time. If someone would travel overseas, they would go to Europe and they would be asked, where are you from? They normally wouldn't say, I'm from America. They would often say, I'm a Virginian or I'm a New Yorker or I'm a Pennsylvanian. So at that time, it was true that people were much more beholden to their states than they were to the national government. So, you know, let's I won't go through them all. But he says, let's look at how you um, how you change the Constitution. Well, if you want to amend the Constitution, you got to go through the states as well. You know, two thirds proposal by the House and the Senate for an amendment and then ratification by three quarters of state legislatures. So the Constitution cannot even be amended without the agreement of at least three quarters of state legislatures. So where he comes down in terms of his argument is that the constitution, this new national government is both national as well as federal in nature. But if you had to choose between the two, there are more federal components than national components. I think it was a very compelling argument in, our, in Federalist number 39 for why anti-federalists should not be afraid of this new national government and why they should support this new constitution. But again, the combination of the Bill of Rights and these 85 Federalist Papers taken together really got the ball rolling to New York, ratifying the constitution, and eventually the constitution was ratified by all 13 states. We will spend some time in this class going through the constitution, but I would like for, at this point, for us to kind of go on in our discussion of American government, get all the basics of American government out of the way, and then we can uh, devote some time specifically to going through the Constitution, talking about the seven articles and the 27 amendments to the Constitution to make sure we all have a working knowledge of what our expectations are as public administrators under that Constitution. But we'll do that a little bit later on. But our entire discussion up to this point in time has been about how the Constitution limits the power of government. It's a social contract, and so therefore it places limitations on the power of government. But we really haven't talked a lot about what we mean by the word power. Power is a very important term in the discipline of political science. You get 10 political scientists, you put them all into a room, you let them out, and they probably all have 10 different definitions of, of power. My question to you is, how do you define power? What does power mean to you? So how would you define power? Oops. What's meant by power? Uh, Miles says authority. Absolutely. It's authority. Authority of someone over someone else. Uh, see, the power of influence, the amount of ill. They're coming in fast and furious. Uh, there we go. Scroll up a little bit. Uh, influence, yes, ability to act and decide, control, control over people or resources, amount of influence one has, power is having influence. 
I agree with all those. And absolutely, power is about influence, the ability to influence others. And oftentimes when we are exercising power, being able to exert own will of ideas over others, it, when we are able to influence others to do something they otherwise would not do, oftentimes by the utilization of resources, we are probably exercising power. So if we can use resources and authority in order to influence someone to do something they otherwise would not do, we are exercising power. The most basic type of power is coercion. And every government, in order to be considered a government, has to have the ability to exercise coercion of its citizens. As citizens, we are coerced to do things we otherwise would not do. We are coerced to pay taxes. In our rational self-interest, we probably would not want to pay taxes or at least the amount of taxes that we are currently paying. We also probably would not want to take the time to serve on a jury. We're coerced to do jury duty. And so governments have this coercive influence, otherwise known as governmental power. There is a very famous sociologist by the name of John Gaventa. I'll put his name into text chat, but John Gaventa. And John Gaventa really was interested in this idea of power. And so being a good social scientist, he decided he was going to go out in the field and he was going to study power uh, among people and see how power actually, what it was and how it was being exercised. So what he wanted to do is he wanted to find the most uneven or unequal balance of power in the, in, in the, in the country. And one of the most unequal balances of power that he found was in rural Appalachia. So he went into rural Appalachia and went into a coal mining town. And he knew in that coal mining town that that coal mining town was a company town. As a company town, it meant that the coal mine owners owned pretty much everything in town. They had a general store that was owned by the company. People who worked in the coal mines were being paid oftentimes not with money, but rather being paid with tokens, tokens that could only be redeemed in the general store, in the company store. These coal mine workers were working very long hours in very dangerous mine conditions. So they are working 70, 80 hours in the mines. And the conditions of the mine were dangerous. If you know anything about coal mining, you know that mines have this dangerous propensity for exploding. Uh, whenever you do mining, you release gases, Whenever gases are released in the mine, if there's any flicker of flame, that's an ignition and the mine can explode. There's a process in mining known as dusting. And whenever you dust the mine, you tamp down the gases, which then reduces the risk of explosion. Well, dusting is expensive. And it's obviously going to cost you more and cut into your profit margin as a coal mine company if you engage in dusting as opposed to not doing the dusting of the mines. So the mines were not being dusted. People were working very long hours in these very dangerous conditions, being paid with tokens rather than being paid with, with money. And what Coventa wanted to know is, why were the coal miners willing to put up with that? Why were they willing to do all these things that seemed to be completely contrary to their personal, rational self-interest? What he wanted to know is, how were the coal mine owners exerting this much power over the coal mine workers? And it led him in his study to come up with three, what he called three faces or three different types of power. One face or one type of power is what he called overt power. Well, it's really what I call overt power, but basically what he means is with overt power, with this first type of power, both parties know that power is being exercised. And so when I used to teach on campus, I would say I'm you know, teaching up on the, the, the third floor of the SBA building you get your midterm exam score, you don't like the score I gave you, you come up behind me and you push me out the window. You're exerting power over me. You're influencing me to go out the third floor window, which is something I otherwise would not do. However, if I see you coming, I know you're the one who's pushing me out the window. So I know you're exerting power over me. You know that you are exerting power over me. Both party know, parties know what's going on. Gaventa says that type of power is the least dangerous type of power unless you're the one falling out the window, it's the least dangerous type of power because everybody knows what's going on. It's very upfront. The second face of power he refers to as mobilization of bias. 
Mobilization of bias is essentially agenda setting. In mobilization of bias, you exert power and influence by keeping issues off of the agenda. So what was going on is the coal mine owners, through campaign contributions to members of the state legislature, they were able to influence the state legislature to not consider coal mine safety legislation. They're able to keep that legislation off of the agenda. That was an exerting uh, exertion of influence over the coal mine workers. The problem is the coal mine workers didn't know that that was going on. All they knew is that the state legislature was not passing any protections for them in the coal mines. They didn't know why. They didn't know the agenda was being rigged by the coal mine owners. So that makes it a more dangerous type of power. The third phase or type of power is what Gaventry refers to as co-optation. I mean, he says this is the most dangerous type of power. It's the most dangerous type of power because the people who are having power exerted over them have no idea it is happening. And in co-optation, what happens is the coal mine owners were able to convince the workers that working 80 hour weeks, that working in dangerous conditions, that getting paid in tokens rather than in money, that all those things were in the coal mine workers' best interests. So they are basically able to co-opt the opinions of the coal mine workers and replace the coal mine workers' opinions with the coal mine owners' opinions. They were able to make the coal mine workers think that what was in the best interest of the coal mine itself was in the best interest of the coal mine workers. That co-optation is, again, the most dangerous face of power because the coal mine workers didn't know what was happening. They didn't realize they were having their opinions co-opted. So why is so, so what? You know, one of my favorite questions in any class I teach is, well, so what? Well, what does that mean? Why are we talking about that? The big so what here is that power is multidimensional. It's multifaceted. And it really serves us well to think about what type of power are we talking about when we're talking about politics and administration. Oftentimes, the type of power that we will see will oftentimes be that second face of power that mobilization of bias, that agenda setting. And that's oftentimes the most prevalent type of power that's being exercised in government. However, co-optation does occur. And we do see people voting contrary to their best interests. And that happens all the time, where they vote contrary to their best interests because their opinions have been co-opted by a candidate, a political party, or a governmental institution. So I bring up these three different faces of power just for you to remember this information, because as we go through this class, whenever we talk about power, we're going to return to this multidimensional definition. We're going to ask the question, well, what type of power are we talking about? Is it overt? Is it mobilization of bias? Or is it co-optation? So power is important, obviously, in any political environment. And it's going to be important for us as a consideration as public administrators. Later on in the class, we will talk about some of the reasons why administrators need to develop their own basis of power, that political parties in our system typically do not provide a lot of cover and a lot of protection for administrators. So administrators have to go out there and develop their own repository of power in order to do their jobs. And we'll talk about that in some future classes. So our system of government is all about power dividing a power horizontally, as well as dividing a power vertically. I think one of the things that we do a good job in our system of civics education is talking a lot about the horizontal separation of powers. We do a pretty good job talking about the three different branches of government and how they interact with each other. Where we don't do as good of a job, I think, is in talking about the vertical separation of power in our system of federalism. A lot of Americans don't know what federalism is. They don't understand what federalism does and the implications and impacts of federalism on their everyday lives. So I'd like to spend a few minutes tonight going through this idea of federalism and how we divide power up vertically across our different levels of government. Now, there are three basic models of federalism three different models of how power can be distributed across different governments. The one model you'll see there on the screen on the right in that inset box is what's called the coordinate authority model of federalism. The coordinate authority model of federalism, you know, let me move some stuff out of my way here. 
The coordinate authority model of federalism says that there are different spheres of influence between national and state governments. So there's one sphere of influence, duties and responsibilities that belong to the national government. Then there's another sphere of influence, duties and responsibilities that belong to state governments. As you'll see in this Venn diagram, those two spheres of influence are separate from each other. They do not overlap. So the relationship between national and state governments is an independent relationship with two separate independent spheres of influence. You will notice, though, in the state circle that the local circle is completely subsumed within the state circle because of what we had talked about earlier with Dylan's rule, that local governments are creatures of the state. Then a second model of federalism is this one called an overlapping model, this middle Venn diagram. In the overlapping model of federalism, all three of your circles, national, state, and local, will overlap in some degree. And so whenever you see NNS, that's where the national and state overlaps. NNL is where the national and local overlaps. SNL is where the state and local overlaps. So in overlapping federalism, the relationship is much more of a relationship of interdependence between the three different levels of government. The way in which they interact with each other in an overlapping pattern is a bargaining relationship. They have to bargain with each other in terms of who's doing what and how they're carrying out their functions. Over here to the left in the coordinate authority model, because they are separate, the authority pattern is that of autonomy in that the national government is autonomous, it is sovereign, state government is autonomous, and it is separate and sovereign. Then your third model of federalism is called the inclusive authority model. In the inclusive authority model, as you can see, the state sphere of influence and the local sphere of influence, those are both subsumed within the national sphere of influence. State governments are dependent upon the national government. Local governments are dependent upon both the national as well as the state government. So the relationship between the levels of government are a relationship of dependency, and it's a very hierarchical situation and that power flows down from the national to the state to the local levels of government. So those are the three basic models of American federalism, coordinate authority model, overlapping authority model, and inclusive authority model. Now, federalism is a very dynamic term. It's something that has changed and evolved over the past 200 years. And the way in which we view the relationship between levels of government in terms of being coordinated or overlapping or inclusive authority has changed as well. Because there are compromises in the Constitution that are written in to placate the anti-federalists and the federalists, there's a lot of interpretation in terms of which level of government should have the power, duties, and responsibilities. From the founding of the nation until the beginning of the Civil War, a lot of federalism authors will make the argument that we were in a first era of federalism known as dual federalism. Dual federalism represented this coordinate authority type of a model. National government and state governments had their different spheres of influence and never the two shall overlap. They were separate spheres of influence and separate areas of duty. In dual federalism, under this coordinate authority model, the state sphere of influence was larger than the national sphere of influence. So if you had to redraw this model for dual federalism, the state circle would be big and the national circle would be smaller. And that was until the Civil War. After the Civil War, Reconstruction the Civil War, we then moved into a different era of federalism known as competitive federalism. The whole idea of states' rights, the whole idea that states put together the union so therefore they can leave the union, that was dead and gone at the end of the Civil War. So that was put to bed. So states could no longer say they had the equal sovereignty of the national government. And so in the competitive era of federalism, what happened is you still had a coordinate model, but this is where the national sphere grew and the state sphere started to shrink. So your national circle gets much bigger than your state circle. Think about in the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, you had the national government starting to usurp a lot of authority and duties from state governments. Whereas state governments used to do all their regulation of commerce, now the national government creates the Interstate Commerce Commission and starts to regulate interstate commerce. You had states that historically controlled work conditions within their states. You now had the federal government 
becoming involved in making sure that workplaces are safe and free of harm. States used to regulate food safety and food quality. Now you've got the national government stepping in and doing it. Uh, states used to regulate pharmaceutical medications. Now you've got the federal government stepping in and doing it. So the national sphere of influence grows through national regulation at the detriment of the state sphere of influence. That's the competitive era of federalism running from the end of the Civil War up until the New Deal. We know we had the stock market crash in the late 1920s. We had the FDR administration come in in 1933 and bring with it this idea of a new deal to help pull state and local governments out of the depths of the Great Depression. FDR's New Deal called for the creation of a lot of new government programs at the national government level. We had the creation of what we call these alphabet agencies, all these new agencies that were created to implement all these new programs to help try and pull the country out of the depths of the Great Depression. When you create all these programs, you create all these agencies, a lot of these programs become predicated upon the grant of money. So we see the rise of what we call fiscal federalism. The national government starts giving grant money to state and local governments to help them out and help them get out of the Great Depression. Once you have national government providing money to state and local governments, the relationship changes from a coordinate model to an overlapping authority model. So now because of all these grant programs, national, state, and local responsibilities start to overlap with each other in this era of cooperative or fiscal federalism. And that's going to run up until essentially the Johnson administration, in the middle of the Johnson administration. John F. Caddy is assassinated in 1963, and Lyndon Baines Johnson becomes president. When Lyndon J Johnson becomes president, he brought a different approach to federalism with him to the White House. And he brought the model known as the inclusive authority model. Johnson believed through his war on poverty and through his great society that decisions should be made in Washington, D.C. Decisions should be centralized at the national level of government. And then the national government will use tools to get state and local governments to come into compliance with these national objectives. So in terms of um, the Great Society and the War on Poverty, a lot of these social welfare programs grew up at the national level. And then the national government would use grants and mandates. They would use money and they would use orders to get state and local governments to come into compliance with these directives as part of these social welfare programs. So everything started flowing top down from Washington, D.C., down to states and down to local governments in very much this inclusive authority model. Through the use of all these types of grants, you then had state and local governments that became dependent upon federal government money, so much so that it's very much this inclusive authority type of relationship. Once Richard Nixon's elected to the presidency and comes into the presidency in 1969, he brings a completely diametrically opposed approach to federalism. He rejected the idea of a top-down type of relationship. And he wanted to go back to kind of this coordinated authority model whereby state governments would have most of the responsibilities and would have most of the duties, shrink the size of the national government, grow the size of state governments. So it's a complete turnaround from Johnson's inclusive authority model. In the Nixon administration, his approach to federalism was oftentimes referred to as new federalism, the new approach to federalism, allowing state and local governments to have the decision-making authority that before that resided with the national government. Nixon's approach to federalism revolved around what we call the three Ds of federalism. The first D is decentralization. He believed in decentralizing decision-making down to state and local governments, allowing state and local governments a seat at the decision-making table so that they could participate in making decisions about issues that directly, uh, directly confronted them, that directly affected them. So decentralize the decision-making model. The second D was referred to as devolution. Devolution is providing the resources for those state and local governments to carry out the decisions that they are making. It's one thing to say you're allowed to seat at the table to participate in decision making. It's another thing altogether to say, here are the resources you need to then carry out the decisions that you have made. 
And then the third D of Nixon's federalism was deregulation. So remove some of these regulations on state and local governments, as well as removing regulations on businesses to free them up to be more entrepreneurial and to act more in their own self-interest. So through decentralization, devolution, and deregulation, we will then turn back power and responsibility to state and local governments. One of the tools that Nixon used to try and do this was something called general revenue sharing. Put that in text chat something called general revenue sharing. And what Nixon would do is he would say, let's turn over a percentage of federal income tax revenue directly back to state governments. We'll give them this money with essentially no strings attached. So they can use this money however they see fit, however think ma they think match their best interests. The problem with general revenue sharing is that from 1969 all the way up until really 1999, we ran a deficit, and so we are spending more money than we were taking in. So there is absolutely no revenue left to share. In 1981, when Ronald Reagan comes into the White House, he was a big believer in Nixon's approach to federalism. He once again wanted to decentralize and devolve and deregulate. So sometimes Reagan's approach to federalism is referred to as new, new federalism, because it was kind of a redo of Nixon's new federalism. Well, where are we at today in terms of this division of power between federal, state, and local governments? I would argue that the era of federalism we are in now is what's called contextual federalism, where it really depends upon the issue. If you want to determine which level of government has the power, has the influence, it depends upon the issue that you are looking at. In some issues, it's the national government. In some issues, it's state governments. In other issues, it's local governments. Prior to this point in time, if you wanted to predict what an administration would do in terms of federalism, you would look at its party affiliation. So if you had a Republican president, that Republican president would probably favor decentralization devolution. If you had a Democratic president, they would probably favor more centralization of functions. However, in contextual federalism, it's not as much ideology as it is issue based. You look at the issue. Democratic presidents may approach issues differently in terms of federalism. I'll give you a, a couple of really quick examples. One example is from the Clinton administration. The Clinton administration wanted to have a national blood alcohol content level of 0.08. That's your drunk driving level. Uh, different states had different drunk driving standards. Some had a 0.06, some had a 0.10, some had a 0.12. The Clinton administration wanted a 0.08 blood alcohol content level adopted across the entire country. Well, there's no place in the Constitution that says the national government can dictate blood alcohol content levels to state governments. There's no such thing as blood alcohol content levels when the Constitution was written. So instead, what the Clinton administration did is it used targeted grants, and it would say, if you are not going to reduce your blood alcohol content level to 0.08, we are going to remove grant money away from transportation. We're going to take transportation money away from you until you reduce your blood alcohol content level to 0.08. That's an example of a, a, a president taking on very much of a centralization approach. However, also in the Clinton administration, we had welfare reform. So in 1996, we had this Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act in which Clinton worked with Republicans in Congress to decentralize the welfare system, to provide these block grants, these temporary assistance to needy family grants uh, to, our, to people who are receiving welfare, and to provide states with a lot more flexibility in terms of how they spent those grants. So at blood alcohol content levels, you had a Democratic president favoring centralization. However, on welfare reform, you had a Democratic president favoring decentralization. So two different federalism approaches for the same president, uh, essentially two years apart. So it's very, very much more issue-based today in our study of federalism. In the era of contextual federalism, what it means for us is that studying federalism is more difficult today than it was in the past. It's not ideological. It is more issue-based today. And you can see a Republican president for one issue being very centralizing and for another issue being very decentralizing. 
But the important takeaway with this discussion of federalism is that federalism is very much a dynamic concept. Federalism changes over the years. And one of the main reasons why federalism changes is because of judicial interpretation. The ultimate arbiter of the Constitution when it comes to federalism will be the Supreme Court. And at certain points in time, the Supreme Court has favored national government power. At other points in time, it has favored state and local government power. And so there's very much this ebb and flow of power between national, state, and local governments. Well, to wrap this up, the big so what question is, well, what does this mean? What does separation of powers and federalism mean for our work as public administrators? I think one of the most important implications is what's called the many masters theory, that as public administrators, we serve many masters. We have to be accountable to the legislature that provides our appropriations. We have to be accountable to the executive that's in charge of, the, of public administration, that's in charge of the executive branch. We also have to be mindful of the judiciary as well, because the judiciary can interpret our actions and can then issue things like structural remedies, whereby they can require us to take certain types of actions to remedy something that's been done in the past. A lot of agencies are dealing with consent decrees that have come from the judicial side of separation of powers. So we serve all three branches of government, but we also serve vertically national, state, and local government. And so we have a lot of different masters horizontally as well as vertically that we need to serve. The problem with that is when you have many masters that you are serving, you have a lot of conflicting, conflicting direction in that if the legislature wants you to go in one direction, the executive wants you to go into another direction, which direction do you choose? If the national government wants you to do one thing and the state government wants you to do something else, which direction do you choose? And so it does make for a very conflictual and very complex type of relationship between all the administrators and all these different multiple masters. It creates for us a very complex network of both cooperation as well as competition. We know that today there are a lot of alliances and partnerships that agencies join into in terms of delivering goods and services to citizens. Agencies oftentimes will partner with nonprofit entities. Sometimes you'll have public-private partnerships. You'll have local-state alliances. You'll have local-national alliances. So there's a lot of cooperation that goes not only horizontally, but also vertically through our system. There's also a lot of competition in that agencies compete against other agencies in terms of what we call the turf wars. That agencies will say, well, this is our domain. Another agency will come along and say, well, this is our domain. So there's also a lot of competition that goes on with that cooperation. What it does overall is it creates for us this unique environment of public administration. And there's a very famous public administration theorist by the name of John Gauss. And you'll run into him again and again throughout the, the program. He was a, a really one of the heavyweights behind the creation of the American Society for Public Administration. John Gauss makes the argument that public administration has a unique environment, it has a unique ecology. And that environment is a very political environment. And to understand what individual administrators do and why they do it, to understand what agencies do and why they do it, we must first understand the environment, the ecology that surrounds those individuals and surrounds those agencies. One of the things that we will focus on in this class is a discussion of that unique environment of public administration. When we get to a discussion of the differences between public organizations and private organizations, we'll spend most of our time talking about the differences between the private environment versus the public environment. And for the most part, the public environment, the public ecology is a much more complex, much more dynamic, and much more difficult to navigate that we sometimes see over in the private sector. And separation of powers and federalism are both important parts of this environment, of this ecology of public administration. And to understand public administration, we must first understand its environment, its ecology. And that's kind of our background information on American government, kind of taking a lot of the information from uh, what you may have gotten in an undergrad American government class and kind of cobbling it all together with an eye on what it means for public administration. 
Where we go from here, though, is I do think it's important for us to, to sit down and take a look at the Constitution, go through all the different parts of the Constitution and talk about what the Constitution means for us as public administrators, how we are sometimes constrained by the Constitution, uh, how we have to abide by the Constitution, and how we have to be cognizant of the constitutional rights and liberties of people that we deal with. I think for tonight, we're going to stop here tonight. Again, a little under the weather, so I think we'll stop here tonight. Next week, when we get together again, we'll start our class by talking about the Constitution. We'll go through all the different parts of the Constitution in the first part of class. And then the second half of class next week, we'll start talking about accountability and ethics. And we'll talk about some of the unique ethical responsibilities that we have as public as compared to private administrators. So next week, Constitution, and then followed by a discussion of accountability and ethics. And then also next week when we start off class, I'll ask for any questions or clarifications on any of the information that we have covered here this evening. Okay, sound good? All right, I am going to, to stop the class now at this point and get a little rest and then uh, we'll be back at it again next Tuesday, again, starting off with the constitution. So if you haven't done it yet, if you could please just look through the constitution in preparation for next week and uh, we'll start off class with that discussion. All right. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a good evening and a good week, and I'll talk to you again then next Tuesday. So take care. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.